So my name is Paolo Colla, I'm Associate Professor of Finance, and I'm the Academic Director of the BF, which stands for Bachelor in International Economics and Finance. So uh, what I want to do with you today during this presentation is, first of all, to tell you a little bit more uh, what is in your study plan, so in the curriculum for this course. Second, I want to give you some uh, flavor of what does it mean studying economics and finance with some examples. And lastly, I want to tell you a little bit more about what our former graduates are doing. So I want to give you some information about their job placement. Okay, so the bachelor is intended in order to make you understand and analyze economic and financial phenomena in an international perspective. Nowadays, it doesn't make any sense to think about economics and finance if not in an international context. Now, what economics and finance have in common is that in order to answer the questions that economics and finance are posing to us on a daily basis, um, what you would need is to have a rigorous quantitative basis, okay? So uh, our goal here is that, you know, like this ground of quantitative tools on top of um, the more specific knowledge that the bachelor is providing you in both the economics and financial domain will enable you to uh, find jobs um, if, you know, if you want to, which means after three years, uh, you want to go and start working instead of continuing studying in a wide range of working environments. And for this, I will show you, as I said before, some examples of um, jobs that have been taken by our former graduate students. All right, so how does your study path work? So it is structured in three steps or three blocks, if you like. So step number one is what we call the common basis or the common foundation. And this means learning the fundamentals, okay? So I will detail you a little bit more uh, what we think is fundamental knowledge here, but in essence, to anticipate is knowledge that belongs to various areas, which is management, economics, finance, quantitative tools, and law. The second step, which starts uh, from the fourth semester for this course, um, is focusing your study. So um, let me tell you that one specific feature of this bachelor program is that after one year and a half, students self-select whether they want to continue studying in economics or finance. This is what we call uh, the track. So choosing the eco track or the finance track. And you know, like this choice clearly will uh, orient the curriculum of our students towards either the economic or the financial domain. And then the last step, which is essentially the last semester typically of your third year, uh, would entail the choice of elective courses in order to fully customize your study plan. It can entail um, an internship experience as well as an exchange program. And then for everybody, there is the final report or dissertation. Okay, so this is the program structure. Let me reiterate because this feature is specific only to this bachelor in our university, which is that you know, after the first three semesters that are taught in common with other programs, most notably uh, when we think about English taught programs, it's the Bachelor of International Economics and Management. So the specific feature here is that uh, you would decide whether you want to continue the rest of your career in economics or finance. Now, so one important thing that I want to highlight is that you don't have to choose today or when you enroll uh, in your program, but rather you would need to decide after three semesters. So the whole idea is to expose, especially those of you that, you know, haven't decided yet whether they want to study economics or finance, to expose you to some basic knowledge in both disciplines in such a way that you can um, select, you know, which field you want to pursue um, in a more, let's say, knowledgeable way. All right, so this is what we call common basis. As I said before, it is common because uh, it goes across some bachelor programs for those that are taught in English. Uh, BF, so this program as well as BM, which is uh, the program in management, they share this common basis. These are the fundamental tools. So here, you know, I tried to group the different courses into areas, okay? So the first area is economics with two uh, courses in economics. So the first module is microeconomics and the second is macroeconomics, 
more or less the distinction is microeconomics. You study how, let's say, individual consumers make their choices or firms. Macroeconomics, you, start, you study how these agents interact broadly in the economic environment. And then there is economic history. The second building block for the common foundation is finance slash accounting. So you have your first course in finance, it's called financial markets and institution. That's an introduction as to how uh, financial markets work. So what are the assets that are traded and who are the players? So who are the financial institutions? And then there is accounting with two modules. Module number one is actually in the first three semesters. The second module is in the fourth semester. Then there is another block. I explained you before that this is very much uh, useful in order to uh, talk about finance and economics meaningfully. And this is quantitative tools. So this includes three courses. That's mathematics one, that's mathematics two, which is financial or applied mathematics, as well as statistics. And then there is another area, which is management or law, management and law, sorry. Okay, <clears throat> then I told you before that after the first three semesters, you have to decide whether you want to go to the econ or the finance track. Now, here you have the courses for the second year, second semester. Those that are in black, as you see, are still in common. So the separation among between the two tracks is not complete yet, right? But you see that the two majors start, you know, having different subjects, and these are those that I have highlighted in blue. So, for instance, for the major in economics, you have markets, organization, and incentives, which is a course that deals with how firms interact in a competitive environment, as well as international economics. International economics is a subject that deals with um, trade across nations, across countries. While if you select the major in finance, you have financial economics, which is, if you like, a finance two course, in the sense that you get, you know, like, um, in deep, into uh, the way in which assets are traded. And then you have international and monetary economics that couples the knowledge about trade with monetary economics. Monetary economics, simply put, is, for instance, how central banks set interest rates or how they impact, you know, like the real economy. All right, <clears throat> so third year. Here is where the two tracks are essentially separated, if not for um, a seminar in CSR and ethics in business. And as you see, you know, economics major, you would take empirical methods for economics, while the major in finance, we take empirical methods for finance. Now, what, what are these? So the discipline is called econometrics. Now, econometrics is, again, a quantitative subject. We can think about econometrics as a way in which we make statistics real in terms of being able, uh, enabling us to study real world phenomena. So let's call this, if you like, applied statistics to some extent. And the key difference between these two courses is that for uh, the major in economics, you will deal with economics phenomena and tools to analyze economics phenomena for finance, you know, like the same thing, but for financial phenomena. And then here we choose what we call the track courses. So in particular, you choose four courses out of this list. So you see that the list has six courses for economics, uh, labor, institutions and culture, so on and so forth, and has five courses for finance. So you need to select four in this list. And lastly, as I said before, typically the second semester of the third year is dedicated to customize your study plan. And in particular, this will be done through the choice of two electives, elective one and elective two. So electives are courses that can be chosen from a wide range of courses that are taught at Bocconi. It's about, you know, 200 courses. And uh, instead of one elective, you can substitute, sorry, for this elective, taking an internship. I'm going to give you some more information about the internship program at the later stage. Okay. Now I want to tell you something about uh, our class. So in particular, I want to tell you something about the freshmen that just started, you know, like last week in terms of what is their background. So this is what I have here on the left panel. So here there is a split of our freshmen in terms of their diploma. Okay, so whether they got it from an Italian high school, that's about 50% of students, or from an international uh, high school abroad, that's 46%, or 
yet an international high school in Italy that's 5%. So you see that more or less we have uh, thinking about, let's say, what is in blue as Italian students and what is in orange and uh, gray as international students, more or less we have an even split, a 50-50 split. Then on the right hand side, <coughs> I have information about um, the choice of the major. So uh, let me be clear, there is not a fixed number of seats for major in economics versus major in finance. Mm -hmm. What determines the split is, you know, like the choices of students in their, after their third semester. So more or less numbers are consistent across the years. And out of five students, we have four students that decide for the major in finance and one student that decides for the major in economics. Okay, now I want to give you some uh, examples of economic and financial questions. Okay, so the first is borrowed from um, this course that we have seen mentioned before, markets, organization and incentives. So what you see here on the left hand side is a Google search for a given brand of shoes. So you see it up there, okay? And you see what comes out in the first page hmm, on Google. Hmm? Actually, you see what came out from this search some years ago. Hmm? And then you see that the first hit on the first page is Google Shopping, okay? So I guess I don't have to motivate a lot that clearly showing up on the first page of a Google search or any engine that you use, and especially showing up as the first hit on the first page has some advantage, right? Typically, you know, like, I don't know what you guys do when you browse for shopping, right? But I typically don't go after the first two pages, right? Uh, maybe I'm a lazy consumer, but clearly what attracts my attention is the first hit on the first page. Now, uh, what is the issue here? So uh, the engine is Google, okay? And the shop is again Google, all right? So the question here uh, that brought the attention of the, uh, at the European Commission level, in particular in terms of the antitrust authorities, is whether this practice of Google of putting its own shop as the first hit, right, was damaging competition or not. In economic terms, we say whether, the question is whether Google was abusing of its position in providing the engine by also putting its shop as the first hit, okay? So, um, as a matter of fact, you know, like the um, antitrust authorities, you know, like after some investigations and so on and so forth, decided that this was uh, an abusive practice, right? So Google was violating, to some extent, the idea of competition among, in this case, shopping services. And as a matter of fact, you know, like the outcome of, you know, like this uh, procedure, right, was to find Google with, you know, quite a substantial fine of about 2.5 billion euros. So my second example of an economic question is borrowed from labor economics. Again, one course for the econ track. Um, so what you see, uh, you know, like on top, you know, for these two pictures is, you know, like some Italian back then, you know, immigrants that were going to Germany, okay? Uh, what you see at the bottom is very likely, you know, like some immigrants coming from Africa to Italy. Hmm? So we hear about immigration, you know, like every day, let's try to take politics out of this room to some extent. And let's try to think about what are the economic consequences of immigration flows. One argument that we um, often hear is that immigration takes away jobs, right, from, let's say, natives, okay? So simply put, an immigrant that comes to Italy finds a job, and this is one job position less for an Italian. Okay, so behind this reasoning, there is the idea that the number of jobs is to some extent a fixed pie, okay? So if an immigrant comes and eats, let's say, one slice of this pie, right, then, you know, like that slice is taken away from Italians, okay? 
But are we sure that, you know, like the number of jobs is a fixed pie? And let me try to give you one example. So if you fly to Luxembourg and you take a cab, right, chances are, you know, I would say 90% chances are that the cab driver is Portuguese, all right? So the question here is this immigrant that moved from Portugal to Luxembourg, Okay, did he or she steal a job from a native or rather, you know, he created a new job because there were no natives to some extent that wanted to drive a cab. So if the answer to this question is the second one, then you see that the conventional wisdom of thinking about the number of jobs is a fixed pie, right, is not entirely right which is to say that immigration can increase the size of the pie by creating new jobs. The third question is borrowed from um, a course, again, EconTrack, Economics of Institutions, okay? So here the idea is to uh, figure out the interplay between politics and in institutions and, you know, like the economic system. Um, so in order to motivate this, right, um, we tend to have, let's say, um, you know, this idea that for an economy to prosper, we need good political institutions. We need, for example, demo uh, democracy. We need to have freedom of speech. We need to have broadly defined institutions that work well. Okay, institutions can be the, for example, the judicial system, right? So we tend to associate good institutions with good economic outcomes, okay? If you think about Italy, right? We hear every day that, you know, like some of the issues in Italy is corruption, right? Other issues are bureaucracy, okay? Typically, you know, like um, entrepreneurs that would like to start a job in Italy, they complain about bureaucracy and the length that it takes in order to open a business. They also complain about how the judicial system is not effective and fast in resolving conflicts and in making contracts, um, you know, work. Okay. So, and in many instances, all of these are taken as symptoms as to why our economy is not growing a lot. So it could grow more if we had good institutions. Okay. More broadly, if you think about, you know, like other countries, there are clear examples, and, you know, like the main example here is China, where a variety of indicators of the quality of institutions would rank this country on the low end, right? Think about freedom of speech, think about corruption, right? Think about state intervention, right? And yet, you know, like the Chinese economy over the last years has been, you know, like growing incredibly. So the question here is trying to relate, you know, like the quality of institution with economic prospering and to see whether there is an impact and study the relation between the causality, actually, between good institutions and an economy that grows. All right, so now let me move to the um, <clears throat> finance track, again, giving you three examples. So the first is borrowed from corporate finance as a discipline within finance. So <clears throat> at the beginning of April 2017, it's Sole 24 Ore, it's you know, our main, let's say, financial newspapers, announced that it would raise additional equity capital. After the announcement, the stock price of Isole 24 Ore dropped by 10%, okay? So, at, you know, like, first reaction to this is why? You know, like, Isole 24 Ore was raising new funds, right? Why the stock market, why did investors punish, let's say, this announcement, okay? So, this brings us to three questions here which is how do firms meet their funding needs? So in particular, in this example, you know, clearly raising additional equity was not a good idea. So what could the Sole 24 Ore have done differently? And this brings us to the different, you know, like financing um, tools, right, that the firm can use. If Sole 24 Ore could have asked, you know, like for a loan to a bank, right? or could have floated a bond to the market, you know, like what are the different, you know, like 
consequences of each of these different financing tools. Okay. The second issue here is simply put, what would managers use, you know, like this additional capital for? Okay. So clearly, you know, like there is, you know, like one first view, right, which is this additional equity capital might have been used, let's say, for a new project. Okay. Digitalize, you know, like the newspaper, right? Or open a new market. Okay. And then there is another view, which is, you know, like this additional money, right? would have been used simply, you know, like to pay debtors. So it would not be, you know, like productive money to some extent. This brings us to, let's say, the image that you have, you know, like in the middle here. We need to study, right, a little bit better what was on the balance sheet, right, of Il Sole 24 Ore. And in this case, you would realize that this additional money would have been used, right, to pay down debt, okay? So the question here is how do the different uh, let's say stakeholders of a firm, right? Which would include managers, which would include the controlling shareholders, the minority shareholders, you know, suppliers, bondholders, and so on and so forth, interact with the firm. And how do they come up with, in this example, this final decision, which is let's raise additional equity. Okay. The third aspect that this, you know, example, you know, enables us to analyze or to think about is what is in the last image. And what is behind this, you know, like dropping the stock price by 10%, okay? So how do markets hmm, react to corporate financing decision? In this example, it is, you know, like a loss by 10%, okay? But then the question is, is this loss large, okay? So suppose that I tell you that, you know, like during the same days, the entire Italian stock market dropped by 20%, Okay, then clearly, you know, like this 10% has to be put in context, right? And compared to the rest of the market, we would be inclined to say that Il Sole 24 Ore did not do as bad as the other players. If I told you that, you know, like during the same days, the Italian stock market raised overall by 5%, clearly this loss by 10% is, you know, like a bad economic outcome. So we need to understand, you know, like how stock market, how the stock market reacts, and in particular, what are the determinants of stock prices. Okay, example number two is borrowed by banking or what we call financial intermediation. So at the beginning of 2016, the European Union introduced a new regulation that was called bank bail-ins, okay? So according to this new regulation, creditors of insolvent banks, so a bank that's doing badly, let's put it this way, right, had to take a loss or a hit before the government would intervene, okay? So the idea behind this regulation was not to have banks that keep on, you know, being, you know, afloat thanks to taxpayers' money. This is what, you know, like state intervention means, okay? So... At the first sight, you know, like you, you might already be surprised that, you know, like when a firm is insolvent, the government intervenes. This is not what happens, you know, like in standard, let's say, bankruptcy procedure. Okay. So the question here is why were banks so special, let's say, before this new regulation? Okay. Which means what do banks do? in order to, you know, promote economic growth, right? Simply put, if they do nothing, right, then we don't need banks. And strictly speaking, we don't need to regulate banks at all. So after we understand what is the role of the banking system in order to promote possibly economic growth, then we need to understand why banks are so special, which means what are the risks that are embedded in financial intermediation? And how do banks manage these risks, okay? If you think about, you know, the Lehman collapse, right? You know, like the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, you know, it was clear, you know, exposed, right? That there were special risks in the banking system that were not managed properly, okay? And then, you know, like the third question is, okay, there is a new piece of regulation for this example. How do we evaluate whether, you know, like this new piece of regulation is effective or not? Which is, did this, you know, bank bail-in regulation achieve its goal or not? 
in order to promote more market discipline on the banking system. Okay, so third example is borrowed from the asset pricing domain within finance. So at the beginning of 2019, the sovereign bonds of Venezuela, of the Venezuelan government for a 15 years maturity, offer the 12% yearly return, okay? Then, you know, like at the first sight, you think about, okay, so these are bonds. Let's go with the common wisdom that bond is less risky than stock, right? And, you know, like 12% per year seems like, you know, a good investment, a good opportunity. But then I'm clearly making this example with Venezuela, right? Which is a case that we are all aware of, you know, like, you know, these days, right? In such a way to make you understand that clearly behind this return, there has to be some risk, okay? In particular, some substantial risk, okay? So the first question is, what makes sovereign bonds risky? Or stated differently, what makes sovereign debt sustainable? For Venezuela, we know. Okay, so the Venezuelan government owns um, PDVSA. Okay, PDVSA is, you know, like a company that drills and sells oil. The revenues of selling oil are used by the government in order to pay the debtors. Okay, and then you start wondering, okay, but how is oil doing? How was oil doing back in 2019? And then oil was and is still doing quite badly, okay? Which therefore casts doubts on the possibility of the Venezuelan government to pay down debt, okay? Which brings us to question number two. Okay, so what happens when, you know, like a sovereign uh, issuer, a sovereign debtor defaults? What are the consequences for the economic system? Both internally, we know, you know, like long queues in front of supermarkets, right? And internationally. And in order to understand the international consequences, we need to understand who is exposed, right, to this type of risk, okay? And after we understand what are the risks of uh, bond investing in this example, or what are the risks associated to uh, Venezuelan um, sovereign bonds, right? The question is, how do we manage this risk? How do we keep this risk under control if in our portfolio we have some of these bonds? Okay, so the main goal was to give you a um, real world flavor of what it means studying economics and finance. Don't be too scared at this stage, right? I kept your attention on the choice between economics and finance, but keep into account that, you know, like these two disciplines are very much intertwined. Anytime, you know, like we think about the economic system, let's think about GDP growth, right? The financial system, clearly has an impact on this growth, right? And anytime we think about an asset, so anytime we think about finance, right? The economic system clearly matters for the evaluation of that asset. So the two disciplines are very much intertwined. And what they have in common, as I told you before, is to have a rigorous analytical background. Okay, so let me turn to my last point here which is to tell you what our graduates are doing. So out of, let's say, 10 students that graduate from BF, nine decide to continue studying at the master level, either here at Bocconi or somewhere else. And one out, out of 10 decides to go and work. So goes on the job market, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me give you examples of uh, jobs that our former graduates have found recently. So, as you may know, this program started in 2014, which means that the first graduates, it's a three years program, so it came out in 2017, okay? So we survey our graduates, we as Bocconi, we survey our graduates, you know, typically one year down the road, so one year after graduation, and then, you know, like, it takes some time to process these surveys. So what I can show you is, you know, like real examples based on the first two cohorts of BF students. So those that graduated in 2017 and in 2018, okay? So these are examples of um, job places uh, attained by our former graduates that decided to go for the e-contract. So if you like, these are jobs in the economics domain. Mm -hmm. So Amazon, I think that there is no need to 
uh, tell you what Amazon does. AT Kearney is, you know, like a firm that does business consulting, okay? Business consulting is an area where, you know, like a firm goes to a consultant in order to solve some of its problems, right? For instance, you know, to figure out why weather and how, why labor costs might be so high. And usually the outcome of this consulting job is to some extent to restructure the firm. Huawei, I guess we all know what it is. KPMG and PricewaterhouseCoopers, again, are examples of consulting firms, although they're more versed in terms of tax advisory, right, and accounting advisory, as opposed to economic advisory. Here are some examples of jobs in the finance domain. Um, so these are essentially banks or financial intermediaries, okay? Typically, you know, like the distinction in the banking domain was to think about a saving bank, you know, like I take deposit from customers, right? And I turn these deposits into loans. Mm -hmm. And the other activity was investment banking. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, banks are typically global banks. So they do, you know, both aspects or both types of um, business, okay? So there is Bank of America, Mary Lynch. In this case, our former graduate is working in the Singapore um, it's not the headquarter in the Singapore offices. Erste Bank, you know, this is um, 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 an Austrian bank, and uh, our former graduate found a job in Croatia. Then Goldman Sachs, you know, I guess you know it needs no explanation. It's probably the leading you know investment bank in the world. UBS and Unicredit. Okay, so thanks for your attention.